Hello, everyone. Ladislas Moyes from the wanderinginvestor.com. So today we're going to have a very interesting discussion, which is real estate in Kyiv in Ukraine with John, who advises a real estate fund there and who helps individual investors make real estate investments in central Kyiv. John, how are you? I'm doing great, Ladislas. I mean, it's a difficult environment right now, but I'm doing pretty well. Uh, it's good to see you again. It's been it, a little while. Uh, it has. It has. It has. Yeah. I'm here in Kiev. I'm kind of feeling. I'm kind of feeling bad. It. It feels pretty good here. Uh, pretty normal, I would say. I, I know other things are happening in other parts of the country, but right now in Kiev, it's pretty normal. Cool. Too much traffic. <laughs> really, too much traffic. Yeah. Yeah. I. I once had an investor tell me that traffic is an interesting sign for you know you know ec economics situation and. There's traffic jams here. Not like it was, but yeah, there's traffic jams. It's okay. interesting. Interesting. Yep. Cool. Because I'm having people contact me on a regular basis, asking me about the Kiev real estate market and wondering if there are any opportunities. So people are really out there. There are some vultures that are looking for, you know, blood in the streets, but that's not the situation in the market. And people just have a hard time understanding that the market is actually doing relatively well in the in the context of the situation so can you can you tell us what you see on the ground in Kiev with regards to real estate well it has a lot to do with what we were talking about before in that uh there's no lending here there are no mortgages and so as a result one the market uh has a lot of potential to appreciate in value if there was lending uh but also no one has holding costs no one has mortgage payments to make every month. And as a result, there's not a, a strong desire for people to sell their properties, especially individual residential properties, at a significant loss or substantially lower than the market was priced uh, before the current situation. So we're not seeing a ton of great individual residential uh, deals. I wanted to mention to you the the one object that we had talked about previously, the Spaska uh, flour mill that we were looking at turning into an office. At the time, we thought it was a great, um, it's a specific situation and that's what exactly what we do and ha what we have to find. The seller of that actually owned the entire block of the of buildings and required money to renovate some of the other properties, so was selling that one property. This is the kind of owner that needs liquidity as opposed to an individual with, with an apartment. So we were looking at buying that for $2.8 million uh, before the conflict. And we approached him a week ago with an offer of 1.8 million, which uh, would be, I would think a substantial, uh, a, a very good purchase price. Uh, he refused. And I think the main theme right now is that, you know, I think given the current risk environment, I think that we have time and that we continue to look at different opportunities. The situation on the ground is is relatively stable on the in regards to pricing on the purchase of sales of most assets. However, so prices aren't down. I mean, prices are down a bit, though. Okay, I would say the major impact would be that prices are down 10, 15, 20, 20 percent. Um, the biggest problem, though, is uh, National Bank of Ukraine uh, foreign currency controls in that all purchases of property must be conducted via bank transfer and must be conducted in Grivna. Well, it's currently against the law or however you want to put it for to transfer Grivnas into hard currency, dollars or euros. And it's also impossible to transfer dollars and euros out of the country. As a And the currency is depreciating and will likely depreciate further. As a result, sellers um, don't want to accept bank transfer in, in Grivnas. And there's restrictions on how many Grivnas you can take out in cash uh, every day. So this is resulting in also somewhat freezing the market in that uh, the only property transactions that can occur can, are occurring in US dollar cash. And uh, those are substantial amounts of US dollar cash. So that's also, I would say more that the, the, like the Ukrainian market, something we've always talked about in, in good times, and especially in bad times, is what I call the liquidity of the market, the ability to purchase or sell something quickly. And uh, to me, that's always been the biggest risk in this market in, in that when there's a problem, the market doesn't go down in price, it just stops. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're more seeing um, 
that then uh, great decreases in price. Interesting. So if you go there with a bunch of physical cash and you're trying to cut a deal, you won't necessarily find anything extraordinary. Well, as, as an advisor and as a, a director of, of a couple of funds, uh, just my experience, I'm not able to make those transactions because technically they are uh, illegal, um, but also normal. Um, if you had uh, a substantial amount of US dollar or, or Euro cash, <laughs> although your Euro cash is worth a lot less today, uh, you almost you definitely could negotiate and, you know, it, it would be a matter of that type of negotiation coming into the meeting literally with cash in a bag and saying, take it or leave it and giving them a low ball price. And, and uh, I, I would think there might be something to be done in that situation. Okay. And what about rentals? Yes. Uh, well, the rental market, of course, we had uh, in, in the funds that I'm advising, we had substantial turnover and, um, the residential market is picking up substantially in the last couple of weeks as uh, especially um, embassy staff is returning. Embassy staff with four children and, and a spouse are not returning, of course. Individual embassy staff are returning. So uh, properties renting for 2000 or less a month are, are definitely being rented. We have 15 properties. Nine of them are now rented. Most of the properties to embassies are renting it pretty much full price, maybe 10% off the rent that we were receiving before. Other properties or larger properties, we do something like we do a two-tiered two structure for rental payments where there's a 50% rental payment during a key of martial law and uh, the contract, the price automatically doubles at the end of key of martial law. So, we, so that we don't lock the rental price into too low a figure too far into the future. Um, that's one way that we're both uh, generating cash flow and and property owners can generate cash flow, but also you know mitigate any downside risk in the future if 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 things improve dramatically and you could uh, increase your prices. Offices, of course, it's a, a little more of a difficult situation. Uh, we are certainly there offering a fifty percent mar uh, martial law discount. We're calling it, um, and uh, several of our offices are not renting as both. I would say it's more, there's a lot of turnover. Businesses are coming and going and thinking things are getting better and coming back and then leaving again. There's a lot of turnover and a lot of uncertainty for the businesses. And a lot of them, you know, um, can relocate, can they have the experience of COVID of working remotely. So that's also made a difference. One thing I think we need to consider for the market going forward is something we were talking about previously, and that's internal emig emigration within Ukraine. Okay. And uh, we're seeing a lot of emigration from eastern Ukraine, uh, Kharkiv, um, Kherson, okay. Donetsk to Kiev. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, left bank. That's sort of the non-business district uh, area of Kiev. A lot of construction going on there, active construction going on. Uh, there's high demand for housing, especially in western Ukraine and also in Kiev. I would expect... Um, when things end and eventually they will that the office situation here in kiev will also be substantially benefit as well uh due to businesses relocating from eastern ukraine so specifically john in the funds that you've been advising can you give us your occupancy rates for the residential fund and for the office fund yes for the residential fund we have uh seven of the nine properties rented so that's uh, about 80 percent occupancy rate and for the offices we're about 60 percent occupied most of those are though like i said uh, about half the rent that we were accepting before um we're uh, cash flow positive uh i think on the residential side currently there are certainly more opportunities um, some opportunities that uh, uh, I do provide for advisory clients that I don't uh, invest in uh, through the funds that I advise, especially what they call smart apartments. Uh, there are a lot of individuals here. And so there's a, a demand for buying relatively small apartments, something like uh, 60 meters or 90 meters and turning that into two apartments or three apartments, sort of studios with a zero bedroom bachelor pad or studios as you would call them and those have the opportunity we're looking at opportunities in the still in the 16 and a half percent 17 percent yield range at in current situation i think an important factor to consider in regards to prices being sticky at this point in time is 
uh, on June 25th, uh, Ukraine became an official candidate country to the EU. Uh, that created a lot of positive sentiment, sentiment here in Ukraine among individuals, especially property owners. That has uh, definitely increased their morale and, you know, stabilized the market and created some expectations for the future as well. And I think that's an, uh, an issue that we need to somewhat address in that before this conflict, uh, I put the probability of Ukraine becoming a member of the EU at approaching zero. Um, I don't think the probability of the Ukraine being part of the EU any longer is, is zero. I think there is some chance that it will become. I have no illusions that it will be quick or and it will be a very long and difficult process if it even occurs. However, should it occur and should the conflict end and the West and uh, the EU and the US um, substantially invest in Ukraine in the rebuilding as they've committed to in, in words, and should the politics at least put Ukraine on a path to more Western and EU integration, which might happen, that will massively impact the market here. One of the theses that we had before the conflict was that if a conflict were to occur, mm. in many ways, it could, and it's sad to say this, be positive for Kiev residential real estate, because we'd see a lot of demographic pressure of people escaping the east of Ukraine. So is this something that you're seeing? Uh, I'm definitely seeing this very strongly. Uh, there has been literally millions of people have... Um, have uh, left Eastern Ukraine and uh, are resettling in Kiev and in Lviv. Uh, I'm seeing a major, like like I mentioned, a, a amount of construction here. I think this, um, one of the most important considerations is not just that it's immigration, but these, um, in 2014, one of the main economic centers of, of Ukraine uh, in Donetsk was, was um, lost to Ukraine. And two more, um, substantial economic centers in Kharkiv and um, Kherson are are now massively affected and will be affected uh, going into the future by by the current situation. As a result, these businesses and these people and this economic activity and and money essentially will will move to the west and will substantially impact the Kiev market as they move to Kiev. John, thank you very much. So, if anyone is if there's any like vulture out there. Um, there is, or anyone who wants to discuss the future and potentially making plans for when the situation improves, there is John's email below in the description. Thank you very much, Ladislas. Always very good to talk with you. All right. And take care, John. Take care, buddy. Talk to you soon. You can go to my website, thewanderinginvestor.com and sign up to the private list. It's entirely free. This way you will be getting insider information as I travel around the world looking for opportunities. Lastly, feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.